loving God, we come before you this day thankful for steadfast love. The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. The covenant that you have kept forever and intend to keep. And we pray that you would open our eyes, uh, give us minds to really want to wrestle with this idea of covenant and understand it and apply it in our own lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can uh, imagine if you're going to be, become a citizen, one of the things that you have to do in terms of things that they cover is the Constitution. And I still think, I don't know, I think in schools, in history, they teach the U.S. Constitution in American history, I believe, although I've been reading articles that said increasingly uh, young people don't actually know much about the Constitution, but you can't understand our nation unless you understand the Constitution. The Constitution is an enormously important document. It's not just um, kind of ancillary. It's the very center. It's important. To be a good citizen, you don't have to know the Constitution in detail, obviously, but you have to have a, son a, a good understanding of it. We talked about the way the separation of uh, powers from the different branches of government. We talk about the Bill of Rights freedom of speech, which is right now a very hot item. All of this is a result of the Constitution, so really, to be a good citizen, you have to have kind of a working knowledge of the Constitution, and that's why we teach it in uh, schools. Uh, immigrants that are becoming citizens need to study it and understand it. It's a very, very important, very central document. Now, I would argue that in a similar vein, covenant, the word covenant is just as central to Christianity and Judaism as the Constitution is to the United States. Now, many of you have probably heard the word covenant. It comes up a lot. We read about it in Scripture. Um, and so in Bible studies, you've probably heard it talked about. But my guess is many of you don't really have a good understanding of what the covenant is all about and this is one of those words if you go to the Oxford dictionary it's not very helpful it's not very helpful um, in helping us to understand the depth and the meaning of covenant as particularly as it applies theologically it applies to the church and so as we are continue this series in the Old Testament that we're doing we started a couple weeks ago we're preaching about the Old Testament this summer I want us to focus in on that very, very important word, covenant. It's important that we understand what that actually means. Now, a covenant is a wit. Let me. I want to read this slowly because it's important to get this. Uh, covenant is a witnessed agreement between two parties that establishes both the relationship between them and the behaviors required of each party toward the other to keep the relationship intact. Let me read that again. A covenant is a witnessed agreement between two parties that establishes both the relationship between those two parties and the behaviors required of each party toward the other to keep the relationship intact. That's, the, that's kind of the theological de definition of a covenant. A physical sign accompanies a covenant which serves both as a reminder to the parties who made it and to others that the covenant exists. And the focus of the covenant is, is on the relationships and the mutual care and fidelity of the parties that establish it. Covenants are freely chosen, and they're ways of bringing outsiders into the family, establishing a special and close relationship within certain parameters. Covenants are made, are intended to last forever. In our own world, probably the example that comes to mind is marriage. Marriage is a covenant supposed to last forever. It's two people becoming one. 
there is generally a symbol, right? Generally, there's the exchange of rings, so that other symbols could be as well. Uh, and so, in, in our own world, that's probably the best example that we have uh, of a covenant. Now, a contract is different than a covenant. A contract are agreements about behavior that might include some of the same provisions that exist in a covenant agreement, but without the understanding of any special relationship. Contracts focus on the legal rights and benefits of the parties, which may stay in place even if the relationship between the parties are dissolved. Contracts end when they end. There's not a sense that a contract is going to last forever. So it's important to understand the distinction between contracts and covenants. Corporations work on contracts. Churches work with covenants. Corporations work with contracts. Churches work with covenants. Now that also explains why, uh, for example, in marriage, divorce is so painful because fundamentally the covenant is about the relationship. It's about bringing someone into the family and the focus on the covenant is on the relationship. And so when those get broken, it's very painful and it leaves scars. When a corporation breaks up, there might be hard feelings, but there isn't, there isn't the same sense of focus on, uh, on the relationship that there is with covenant. And that's why, if any of you have ever been part of a church that's split, that's one of the reasons it's so painful because it's a church is a family, and it's all about relationships. And so when that happens, it's incredibly painful. So it's important to understand that we at church, we are operating with covenants, not with contracts. And so I think uh, our, our thinking, even as we think about one another, when we think about a relationship to God, it's all about relationship. It's not about just behaviors. Yeah, behaviors are included in the, in the covenant, but it's much, the focus is really on the relationship. So I want us now to go to the two foundational covenants that are in the scripture. And they are the basis of everything else. The first is the Noahic covenant, which Lisa read, we find in Genesis 9, verses 8. Actually, the whole covenant goes from 8 through 17. We just read verses 8 through 11. And in that, in that passage, in verses uh, 8 through 17, the word covenant is mentioned seven times. The word covenant is mentioned seven times. In fact, I want to read the whole, the whole thing. So in Genesis chapter, notice how many times in what it said. Then God said to Noah, and this this covenant was made after the flood. The story of the flood and everything gets destroyed, except Noah and his family, those in the ark. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I'm establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy their earth. And I'm going to go on to verse 12. Through God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I have made between me and you and every living creature, that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds that it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy the flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. 
God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all that is on the earth. So you hear over and over that word covenant is made. Notice there is a sign of the covenant, the, the rainbow. And it's meant to be in, per, per, in, per, pet, in perpetuity. Ooh. A little hard getting that one out. In perpetuity. And, uh, and so this is, this is one of the foundational covenants of all of Scripture. Now it follows up. With the next, which is the Abrahamic covenant. So, for 10 generations, there's silence. And then all of a sudden, in chapter 12, God speaks. And God speaks to Abraham. And he speaks to Abraham through covenant. So, I'm going to just again read 12, 1 through 3. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your community and your kindred and your father. And your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in all the and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is the foundational covenant to Abraham and to the Jews. And I want to go over it. There are actually seven elements in it as we go over it. So if, when we look in uh, the beginning of the covenant where God speaks it, in verse 2 he says, One, I will make you a great nation in significance, in numbers. I will bless you, implying there will be material blessing as well. And make your name great. Not only are you going to be famous, but your character is going to be kind of the standard so that you will be a blessing. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. So those who treat you well, I will treat well. And the one who curses you, I will curse. In other words, those who don't treat you well will have misfortune. And again, God is calling Abraham to go into a foreign land where he's going to have no protection. So the idea is, I'm going to be protecting you as you go in. And in you, the number seven, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The whole world is going to be blessed. So in the Abrahamic covenant, there's a, a movement from the particular to the universal. First, I will bless you, Abraham, and then I will bless those who are directly relating to you, and through you, I will bless the whole world. So, the, upon these two covenants, everything else is based. You think of the covenant, the Noahic covenant, is the covenant that God has made not only with humanity, but with all, of, all creatures. It's a covenant made to the world that is in perpetuity, that God will will not destroy like he had done before, and God intends to bless. And so, there's a covenant which I think the implication for us in terms of our partnership invo involved in the covenant, taking care of the creation and taking care of the world, it's all there. God is fundamentally making this covenant with everyone, with all living creatures. And secondly, then, he's, he's making this covenant with Abraham because God has chosen to work with a particular people that God just decided to choose. It wasn't because they were more deserving than anyone else. It was God's choice to choose them. But always in that covenant, in this, in this relationship, the end goal is always the blessing for the world. It's that all people will be blessed. It's not just that you will be blessed or your family will be blessed, but this blessing is extending to the whole world. It's universal in its intent. And so we need, we need to understand there are other covenants that come along, the Davidic covenant, but they're all built on these two covenants. And that's why when we come, I had, I had us read an Advent text out of the book of Luke, St. Luke. But in Luke, 
chapter 172 when Zechariah is prophesying before Jesus is born it says this thus he has shown mercy God thus God has shown mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered the Holy Covenant he's remembered the Holy Covenant so Jesus coming as followers of Jesus understood this is part of the promise God has always promised to be faithful and to make things right and so Jesus coming then is part of that covenant faithfulness now this is I think so important for us to understand and that is in the covenant with God we are called to be partners we're, we're part of that covenant but we tend not to be very faithful covenant partners God is always faithful God is always there God is always faithful and so there's actually even some words in the Old Testament covenant faithfulness is a word that's sometimes used and sometimes steadfast love I've increasingly incorporated that into my own vocabulary into my own prayer life that's that that steadfast love comes from the Hebrew word called hesed which really is about God's covenant love it's God's covenant faithfulness and it's very interesting because prophet after prophet when God sends the prophets because the people are going right and left they're not being faithful they are always they are they are really kind of sharing God's almost angst the the hurt that God experiences because of the faithlessness of the covenant partner in fact one of the primary metaphors that the Old Testament uses about this faithlessness is adultery God is saying you're you're just not being a faithful spouse you're going after other people and and so that's a very prominent metaphor that we find over and over especially in the prophetic uh, sections of Scripture talking about the hurt and so God gets angry and bad things happen to the Jews but he always it, there's always the grace there's always the love there's always the covenant faithfulness that in spite of everything they've done in spite of how much they don't deserve to be the covenant partner God's covenant faithfulness is so great God is always reaching out even in the midst of their rebellion God will not let them go because God is a faithful covenant partner his love extends even when we are totally rebellious and unfaithful and if there's one thing we need to understand about this God we worship it's that this God is made the covenant and this God will not give up on the covenant and this God will not give up on you and me and it doesn't matter where we are in our life if we're very far afield this God is constantly seeking out and constantly wooing us there's a great little verse in 2nd Timothy 2 13 it says if we are not faithful he will still be faithful Christ cannot deny who he is the very essence of God is faithfulness to the covenant and we are a covenanted people it turns turns out that reformed theology which is the the history of this church is about the covenant it's covenant theology it's about God's faithfulness God's call to us and has revealed himself now fully in Christ and not only that you can then think about this covenant you can also think about scripture then as the document of the covenant once one New Testament scholar writes the Bible should be considered the charter document of the covenant that stands at the heart of the relationship of God and humankind the Bible should be considered the charter document of the covenant that stands at the heart of the relationship of God and humankind I can't remember who it was that said it but there is a way in which scripture is a love letter with all of this in it the Old Testament and the New Testament the bottom line is always God's covenant faithfulness go astray consequences happen but God is always reaching out always wooing us always trying to draw us back because God is faithful and God loves us
And the church, as a church, we are in a covenant. We are covenant partners with God. <laughs> the scriptures are the charter document. We are family. Not a perfect family, for sure, but that can help us understand sometimes, like, if I wanted to take, pull this carpet out, right here is blue carpet, the stuff you're standing on, ooh, I think there would be, there would be some unhappy people if we, if we, you know, when you do stuff like that, it's because we're family. It's not because it's a contract. We haven't contracted. It's like, oh, I don't care. They pulled the carpet out at the place you work. Would you care? Probably not so much. If, if we do even sometimes minor changes, it can, it can really raise up some hackles. And one of the reasons for that is because we're family. We're family. And we're family because of this covenant God, his faithfulness. And he has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. And so my hope for us is that we will live into the covenant. We may be these faithful covenant people of this God who loves us and faithful covenant partners in this thing we call the church. We are family. Amen.